Hi guys, just a quick note from my house here in Sydney in the midst of a windstorm to say that we recorded this series before the coronavirus outbreak. Uh, so quite a bit has changed since we recorded this in terms of work-life balance, but whatever your circumstances are now, we hope you find the advice in this podcast useful and best of luck. My name's Alice Fraser. I'm a comedian, but I haven't always been. Back in the day, I was a lawyer, working in one of those top-tier law firms. It's one of those jobs that's really hard to get, and I was really excited at the time to be working with some of the best minds in the country. But it didn't work for me. I ended up crying in a cupboard every day and deciding to leave the law forever. Now I'm a comedian and podcaster full-time, and I don't spend nearly as much time crying in cupboards. These days I can cry wherever the heck I like and I call it art, which comes with its own different types of stress. But those days working at the law firm were really difficult for me. They made a mark on my psychology and it's made me interested in the way we work. So for this series, I really want to find out if there's a way to achieve so-called work-life balance. Because I know it's not just me. Nowadays in the UK, more than 10% of people are working more than 50 hours a week, one in five are taking days off because of stress, and only a third of people say they're satisfied with their work-life balance. And America isn't any better. I mean, they have some of the longest working hours in the world, the least vacation days. It's like you have to brag about how hard you work all the time. If you're wondering whose voice that is, it's Dr. Ash Rampura, my science sidekick. Sidekick? Yep, you're the Robin to my Batman. (laughs) He's here to help out with the brain side of things. Yeah, so I'm a neuroscientist, and and I've been studying the brain for something like 25 or 30 years. You know, I started out in medicine, so I'm a a clinical neurologist. I'm a doctor who sees patients with diseases of the brain and central nervous system, and I'm also a cognitive neuroscientist, so I study how the brain produces behavior and and thinking. Um, But in addition to being a scientist, you know, on a a personal level, I'm really bad at work-life balance, and I feel (laughs) like I need to get a better handle on it. At two, Rampura, I thought you, of all people, would have a proper work-life balance. Not, not at all. No, I mean, look, I, I, I work in the hospital, I do research in a lab, I've got a little kid at home. A- at some point, I think I had a friend. It's, it's just hard to, to, to make all of these things fit in with the structure of the day. And I'm, I guess I'm just hoping that science has something to say about how that can be possible. Right, so hopefully we'll have plenty of tips for you, fully backed by science, throughout this series. We'll be looking at the workplace, technology, sleep, time, children, how all these things can either help or hinder your sense of balance. Yeah, and we'll be talking to a guy who's tried to solve work-life balance issues by completely changing the way he works. Working to retirement is a massive gamble, and I'm not a gambler. I don't want to take that kind of risk. I'll find out about the extreme lengths people go to to get more time in their day. On multiple occasions, I'd fall asleep standing up. I was hallucinating. It was really, really, really rough. And we're going to put Ash through the ringer to find out more about the role of stress. I can't believe you talked me into doing this. This is such a bad idea. Yeah, I'm still scarred by that. This is Make Life Work. An Audible Original. Okay, so you're a lawyer. I guess I'm still having a hard time picturing that. You seem like such a nice person now. (laughs) Well, just imagine me in a suit looking much more stressed. I was a grad lawyer, which is like a baby lawyer, and you get all this kind of grunt work. And so we would try to prove ourselves by staying longer and longer and longer and being there more and more and more. And it just felt like if you ever left, it was a sign of your weakness and things like your mental health and physical health just were put aside in order to prove that you were good at the job. We were just in this kind of just constant grind of stress. Yeah, and it's really strange. I think, you know, we're all in that constant grind. That you, you, Do you remember that famous economist from the 1930s, John Maynard Keynes? Vaguely, yeah. So Keynes had this idea that as technology advanced, work would be done more and more by technology and it would free up more time for leisure. We'd be getting to do all of these fun things that we don't normally get to do. But somehow that's never happened. So this is the thing. We thought by this time in the future, we would be living lives of leisure, and we're not. So many of us are working long, long, stressful hours. Why? I mean, you know, I have no idea. But but luckily, we're going to be joined by someone who's been looking into this, someone who knows exactly what it's like to be out of balance. 
I really thought I was alone. I thought everybody else had it wired. And you'd go to people's Facebook pages, and there's these beautiful, lovely Sunday afternoons with the family, and the light is golden, and the leaves are turning, and it's sparkling. And I just didn't feel any of that. I felt, um, you know, incredibly stressed all the time. You could almost get paralyzed. There's so much to do. You don't know where to start. This is Bridget Schulte from the Better Life Lab in America, and she's the author of Overwhelmed, a book about how exhausting modern life is right now. Oh, I remember Bridget. We spoke to her for our meditation series, Calm World. She was telling us about how the world is getting faster. Yeah, the very same person. So Bridget is helping us out again here. She's been researching work-life balance issues from all kinds of angles for a long time. But since she talked to us last time, she's really been focusing on this idea of overwork and what drives it. And to explore that, she decided to go to a country that's had devastating consequences from overwork. So I went to Japan, where the research shows they work among the longest hours of any advanced economy in the world. I mean, we're talking about 80 hours of overtime a month being fairly normal. I mean, nearly a quarter of the companies expect this of workers. That's the baseline standard. And Bridget discovered that this has some really serious impacts. There's a phenomenon there called karoshi, where it's literally called death from overwork, where you work so many hours that you have a heart attack or a stroke. What's happening more with younger people, they're feeling hopeless and they feel depressed, and so they leave the work or they commit suicide. There's also huge societal repercussions, the the very low birth rate. People are not marrying. They're not having families. They don't feel like they can because work requires so much of their time and so much effort and energy. You know, and these impacts are really significant. In, In 2018, for example, Japan's birth rate was the lowest level it's ever been since records have been kept. And in the financial year ending in 2017, there were reported 190 deaths attributed to Karoshi. That is so heartbreaking. It's one of the things that I found toxic about working in a large corporation when I did, that a job can come at the cost of someone's actual health. Exactly. So Bridget started looking into why Karoshi is such a big problem in Japan, why so many people are working these extremely long hours. And as you can guess, you know, it's it's a complicated issue. But as she started looking deeper, Bridget realized that something doesn't add up. It was sort of written about as if it were just sort of something in the Japanese psyche or Japanese culture, that there was just, maybe it was samurai, the Bushido culture. There was just something about Japan uh, that made, uh, that, that sort of sparked this phenomenon. And I, and I really, after spending time there, I really disagree with that. You know, because you see some of these same patterns, not just in Japan, you see it in South Korea, you see it in China. And frankly, in places like the United States, we don't track the data in the same way. So we don't know if there is an American karoshi. So even this word, karoshi, didn't really exist until the 1970s. You know, this is a relatively recent idea, even in Japan. So Bridges started to realize that this is not just inevitably a part of Japanese culture, that there's something else going on in the country, and in other places too, that's driving this behavior. It's very much the environment that's been created, the expectations that have been created in the work culture, by corporate leaders, by workplaces, by the national policies that then are set. We're seeing this all over the place, this workplace environment. And, you know, as any psychologist will tell you, humans are basically herd animals. We live in these groups, we live in tribes, and we tend to do what the tribe says. Human beings are incredibly uh, affected by the environment that they work in, uh, by the environment that they live and breathe in. And so whatever environment we create, that that influences the way we think, that influences the choices that we make, or the choices we feel like we can make. You know, for many workers who do would ostensibly have the choice not to overwork, say in professional jobs, they feel like they don't have a choice. You know, many researchers will call it the non-choice choice. Yes, exactly. The non-choice choice. I remember it was called uh, the CLM, 
The fear of the CLM, the career-limiting move, was the thing that dominated these non-choice choices. For example, my contract said a particular time that I was technically meant to work at, but it also said we'll expect you from time to time in a reasonable way to stay over time or on weekends. And what that meant for most of my grad year was that they had maybe two weekends in the whole year. And, and that was not because anyone was telling you that you had to. It was because if you left early, people would look at you weird. Yeah, you know, the, these corporate expectations, they're not written down anywhere. They're not written in the human resources manual. They're just part of the workplace culture. You know, the idea that being in the office every weekend is good. But, but this behavior, Bridget says, it's built around a disturbing mythological creature. Well, we're into mythology now? I mean, it's not like the Bigfoot or the Yeti. In fact, it's something much more chilling. The, the mythological ideal worker Oh, no. I've met her. She's horrible. She eats babies. She sucks people's <laughs> blood. The ideal worker is the person who would come in early and stay late and eat lunch at their desk and travel at the drop of a hat, basically be married to the job. It's become almost like a religious belief that you have to work these long hours and that, uh, that that's a sign of dedication and commitment. Yeah, in America, we call it FaceTime. Being at your desk for hours and hours, being seen to put work above everything else, that somehow leads to productivity. The, the research is so clear that that's not true. You can push yourself and work, you know, 50 or 60 hours for a couple weeks, but at the end of about three or four weeks, you start getting really tired and fried and burned out, and it takes you longer to do things. You might make mistakes, and you might not be able to think outside the box or make connections. And you're actually, you're no further ahead than if you had just worked a, a typical, you know, 35, 40-hour week all along. Well, the good news is, recently in Japan, they're getting ahead of the curve. They're trying to fix this culture. So hours there have been going down. They've put in a law to limit overtime. And there's even this recent experiment at Microsoft in Japan, where they tried a four-day week, and they found that their productivity went up by something like 40%. That is amazing. We're going to be looking more into the four-day week later on in this series. But in general, the idea of the ideal worker is still so pervasive, and we're all buying into it. If everyone else is staying late, we tend to think, wow, what a hard worker. Yeah, instead of, hey, that person's really inefficient. <laughs> exactly. And that is what makes it so hard to leave if everyone else is staying. And we are seeing those costs everywhere. There are extreme cases like Karoshi, but there's another issue we're starting to hear more about. Being this ideal worker, staying at all hours, giving your all to the job can cause something called burnout. That's what happened to me with my law job. I just suddenly had nothing left. Yeah, and, you know, burnout is an interesting word. It's being written about a lot in the media lately, that burnout is on the rise. But it's a difficult concept. It's a bit slippery. You know, it's not like a recognized medical condition. Well, medical condition or not, it is definitely a thing. I think it's a really serious thing. I have friends who've had this. I know I experienced it, but I'm not going to just rely on anecdotal evidence. I'm no, I know that's not going to get past your no. scientist doctor brain. I have someone to back me up on that. Meet Paula Davies-Lack, who is also an ex-lawyer. So I actually burned out during what became the last year of my law practice. Oh, what kind of law did you practice? I practiced commercial real estate law, so it was... What? Me too! No way! <laughs> That's exactly the same law as burned me out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know what message that sends to folks who are interested in commercial real estate law. So, Alice, this whole series is turning into something of an anti-law mission. Well, I don't want it to be that. There are plenty of people who love the law, and the particular kind of law I was doing was this really interesting, big deals, complex things, people selling land or buying land or leasing land or just very many, like, different documents and different parties and, you know, big structures being built. Paula loved it, and for seven years her level of work was high but exciting. And then somehow it started to pile up and up and up. There were only a very small number of us who were working on hundreds of these commercial real estate deals, so, so the volume and the pace of the work was, was, was really high. She started to notice not only was this making her tired, but she was starting to feel tired all the time. 
it just became so effortful to try and just drag myself out of bed and drag myself to work and just kind of get myself through the day. And with that amount of effort just to get to work, she found she was too tired to do anything outside of work, things that used to cheer her up. I, I got to the point where, you know, my relationships were suffering. So one of the best things that I did, I think, to manage my stress was to hang out with my friends on the weekend and to hang out with my husband. And and I wanted to just, like, stop doing that. And I, I kept telling people, just give me a glass of wine and some bad reality television. And I just want to, like, veg out on the weekends and to just try and recover. And that was the wrong strategy. And then she started to get physically sick more and more often. So the adrenaline and the stress really kept me focused when I was in the middle of actually working on a deal and closing a deal. But when that ended, it was like that adrenaline pipeline shut off and then I would get a cold or I would get a stomach ache or I would get a headache. And every now and again, that's not a bad thing, but this was happening every time I closed a deal, which was, you know, two or three times a month. So the the volume of, of those little illnesses really increased. I remember that happening. I had a symptom of my face went numb. Oh, yeah. Because I'd had a couple of days of working these incredibly long days and I was really worried about it because I thought maybe I was having a stroke Mm -hmm. or something and I spoke to a colleague and uh, she said, oh, yeah, that happens. (laughs) Like it's normal. (laughs) Like it's normal. Like that's just something that's going to happen. Your your face will go entirely numb. (laughs) It's crazy how we start to just normalise things like that. And, uh, you know, for me, I ended up in the emergency room twice. I had really bad stomach aches. And so, I mean, it was so painful that I couldn't stand up. Sometimes your face goes Just numb. a completely normal thing. That's law. Anyway, this was the point in Paula's journey that she started to think that it wasn't worth it. But I said, this is sort of my line in the sand. Like, I'm not willing to um, sacrifice my health in this way in order to um, have what I want at work. Like, work's taking too much for me and not giving me enough anymore. Um, And so that's really where I, I started to think about what would my next steps need to look like. It took Paula almost a year to decide on those next steps. After a short fling with becoming a pastry chef, she decided to go back to university and do a degree in positive psychology to help get to the bottom of this problem. And the more she investigated burnout, the more she found her situation and mine was far from unique. The same common warning signs of burnout appeared again and again. The first is chronic exhaustion. So the word to kind of think about is chronic. So it, everybody has tired weeks and days and months, and that doesn't necessarily mean you're burning out. But do you just notice that you are feeling just more physically and emotionally tired, fatigued, exhausted more often than not? Another is chronic cynicism, which Paula experienced big time. So the notion that everyone and everything just bugged me or rubbed me the wrong way. So I wanted to get into work as fast as I could. I'd say hi to everybody really quickly, and then I'd go into my office and I'd shut the door and I would just think to myself, please leave me alone for as long as possible. Yeah, that definitely happened to me. And as I said before, our walls were made of glass in this office. I didn't realize until I started doing it regularly, if you cry in a glass office, the walls fog up. Oh, God. (laughs) And then the last big warning sign that I talk about, I call every curveball is a major crisis. I know exactly the same thing, where you're feeling like you're overwhelmed, you've already got too much on your plate, and somebody comes in, knocks on your door and goes, hey, have you got capacity? Which was the workplace slang for, have you got space to do extra work? Even if it's a very level one sort of ask, your response is a very level 15 sort of like, no, I can't do this kind of reaction. Um, If you notice that in yourself or you see that in other people, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's burnout present, but it should absolutely be a red flag um, that, uh, you know, some questions should be asked or a conversation should be had. So Paula's next question was, how big of a problem is this really? But in terms of getting actual figures, it's not easy. Some employers are better at tracking it than others. The profession that really has, I would say, the best handle on rates of burnout is healthcare, is the healthcare profession. Probably about 10 years or so ago when I started to jump into researching this, um, they were noticing rates around a third to maybe 40% or so of um, physicians and providers having some semblance of burnout, and that rate is now over 50%, so more than half. And while other industries don't have nearly as good data, it's clear this is a widespread problem. 
in finance and accounting. Um, there are some statistics and data to suggest that, again, we're talking about a third to 40 percent of folks feeling a sense of burnout and that that stays elevated for a number of years. And just anecdotally, I hear from teachers and I hear from folks in tech uh, that, that this is really a problem across profession. So there's not good data on burnout in the law, but there's a shockingly high rate of depression. You're almost four times as likely as a normal person to be depressed if you're a lawyer, which seems to indicate that there's a problem, right? All this burnout is having a huge effect, not just on the mental and physical health of workers, but on the whole sector, on the whole economy. So folks who are burned out are really folks who are potentially looking at wow, should I go to the place down the street? Should I go somewhere else? And that has a really high cost and a bottom line impact for organizations. All of these things do. This is quite easily a a multi, multi multi-million dollar problem. So Paula's doing her bit to fight back against the cost of burnout. She set up her own business, the Stress and Resilience Institute, which advises corporations, including law firms, about how to stop burning out their employees. And it's not always easy convincing managers that this is something they should worry about, but she does have a good business argument. And last year, the World Health Organization actually classed burnout as a syndrome. Now, Dr. Ash, what does a syndrome actually mean? So a syndrome just means a a cluster of symptoms. Like, you know, Paula's mentioned exhaustion and withdrawal from social activities and, and chronic cynicism. You might pull all those together and you say when these things all occur together, that's a syndrome. As for Paula, having a syndrome that is on the books helps her to convince bosses they need to be thinking about overwork as a real problem. She also has one very important piece of advice for those people in those companies who might feel like they're approaching burnout. One of the things that I would tell people is to say something, um, which is, is one of the best and hardest pieces of advice that I say to people. Um, because I know for myself when I was burning out, and you mentioned this too about your own experience, is that the whole notion of I can't let anybody see that you know I'm struggling and I'm going to look like the weak link and nobody's going to want to have me on their team if they know that I'm struggling with stress. Um, but it's the one thing that's keeping you from from really, I think, having the type of work that you want to have. So tell someone. It can be anyone. It's not a sign of weakness to be struggling. Have that conversation. You know, absolutely, Alice. I I think you're right. But so far in this episode, we've been talking about highly paid professions like lawyers and accountants and doctors. But actually, the situation is the best in those highly paid categories because those people have a lot of options. The situation is actually much worse for most people. Yes, absolutely. I was in one of the most privileged jobs in the world. And I can't imagine how it would feel so much worse for people who didn't have that level of privilege. Yeah, and I mean, you're giving your life for it, but at least you're getting a paycheck at the end of the day. So people in jobs without security, you know, with zero-hour contracts, have all these additional worries about pay on top of their overwork. Bridget Schulte has been thinking about this as well, which is why she argues that this problem needs to be fought on every level. I think it's really important that we look systemically at what we need to do to sort of fix the bigger system. How do we design a human-centered capitalism so that it's not all of the fruits of the labor going to the ownership class and creating so much inequality? And how much more powerful we could all be if there were this sense of, you know, putting humans in the center of the equation and not money? I mean, I agree with this absolutely, but how do we do that? Do we burn everything down and start again, like the Joker in Batman? (laughs) Okay, but I think getting through all of that would be a little bit difficult in a six-part series. But Bridget, you know, like Paula, is looking at ways to encourage this change through her Better Life Lab. I mean, she's looking at how policies can inspire positive change. But, you know, most of us are struggling right now, and luckily she has some simple tips for helping us get started. There are things that you can do, and it's important to know that, and Honestly, the first thing that I just say, and it's something that I have to remind myself to do all the time, and that is just stop. You know, disrupt that cycle of constant busyness and running and and overwhelm. Sometimes we feel like we can't. Like, oh, there's too much going on, and I have too much to do. I can't. But it is so important to just stop and breathe. Notice the color of the sky. You know, notice your breathing. Just stop. 
So what do you reckon, Ash? An achievable goal? Look at the sky? I guess I could look at the sky. I mean, that doesn't seem that hard. (laughs) I think we can try. Okay, well, look, over the rest of this series, we're going to be diving deeper into some of the things you can do to help fix your work-life balance and maybe some of the things you shouldn't do. I'm going to investigate whether you can claw back time by giving up something we spend hours of our day doing. And we'll look more closely at the role technology is having in all of this. Will we end up throwing our phones in the bin, Ash? Well, I've already thrown mine in the bin. I can't find it. I've been looking (laughs) all morning. But, you know, before we do that, we're going to start by talking about the workplace. So Bridget mentioned this idea of literally working yourself to death. We'll look closer at the role of stress, a key player in the work-life balance, and why it's so important to find time to reset. Plus, we want to find out exactly how stress affects our bodies. I'm going to be putting Ash way out of his comfort zone. I can't believe I agreed to this. (laughs) Just you wait.